to another episode of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week, we're going to be looking at the case of Actavis UK Limited and Ellie Lilly and Company. And the citation for this case is 2017 UKSC 48. This case in particular concerns intellectual property law, which is an area we don't get to cover very often on the podcast, but it is very interesting and allows us to ask some really interesting legal and philosophical questions. The actual dispute is about how a chemical called pemetrexed can be used as a therapeutic treatment for cancerous tumours. On its own, this chemical can have a range of negative side effects, but Ellie Lilly, one of the parties to the case, found that these negative effects can be avoided if pemetrexed disodium is administered to a patient alongside vitamin B12. In order to protect this find, Ellie Lilly took out a European patent and have successfully marketed the medication as Alimta since 2004. The problem in this case arises when the other company in the case, Actavis, started their own product that also combined Pemetrexed and vitamin B12, but sought to get around the patent by using different compounds. So, for example, instead of using Pemetrexed disodium, Actavis would use Pemetrexed dipotassium, albeit to the same effect. The question then is whether this is enough of a difference to avoid breaching the patent. As the case made its way through the lower courts, a distinction was drawn between a direct and indirect infringement of the patent. By the time the case got to the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal had found that while there had been an indirect infringement, there was no direct infringement. This means that while Ellie Lilly appealed arguing for a direct infringement, Actavis also launched a cross-appeal arguing that there is no breach whatsoever. Before we dig in, you may already have an idea about what the fair outcome to this case would be, and you should keep that in mind as we explore the judgement. The relevant law on the matter is the European Patent Convention 2000, and in particular the Protocol on the Interpretation of Article 69.1 of the European Patent Convention, where Article 1 states right from the off that a patent is not purely limited by its literal meaning. However, to find out whether there has been a direct infringement, there are two questions that need to be asked. Firstly, is there an infringement based on a normal interpretation? And secondly, Is there an infringement because the variation on the original patent is essentially immaterial? If the answer to either question is yes, then a court may find there to be a direct infringement. The Supreme Court found that the answer to the first question was no, but in order to answer the second question, there were more questions that had to be asked. In fact, there are three further questions that have to be answered in this particular situation. Firstly, does the variation on the original patent achieve substantially the same result in substantially the same way? Secondly, would it be obvious to an expert in this area that the substantially same result is achieved in substantially the same way? And finally, would someone reading the patent conclude that the original inventor intended that strict compliance with the literal meaning was an essential requirement to the invention? Here then, the answer to the first two questions would have to be yes, and the answer to the third question would have to be no, in order to establish a direct infringement. Going back to the original case, we can say that the Actavis products do also use Pemetrexed alongside vitamin B12, and also achieve what is substantially the same result, in the sense that they are a therapeutic treatment for cancerous tumours. Such a conclusion is fairly obvious to the lay user, never mind an expert in the area. In response to the third question, the Supreme Court held that it is highly unlikely that Ellie Lilly, as the original inventor, would have intended to exclude the variations of Pemetrexed disodium from the original patent. Putting this all together, we can see that there is a direct infringement of the patent, and the court found in favour of Ellie Lilly Although this means that the cross-appeal from Actavis does not arise, the justices did also point out that there would also have been an indirect infringement of the patent. At first glance, this may appear to be a fair decision. 
After all, Actavius have basically taken a product that already exists, changed it slightly, and then marketed it as its own. Nevertheless, there are some very solid arguments that criticise the judgement in this case, and they are worth exploring in more detail. I would not normally recommend delving into the comments section of blogs for clarification on any subject, as that way madness lies, but there is a great page called ipkitten.blogspot.co.uk that is regularly updated and has writings by people who really know their stuff. The article on this case has more than 100 comments and features lively discussion amongst a very interactive community. Many of the users are actually critical of the judgement and begin by noting that this is more of a case where the patent has simply been poorly drafted in the first instance and the courts have rescued it when they should have allowed it to fail. In other words, if Ellie Lilly had intended for other variations of Pemetrexed to be included, then they should have said so. This might seem a little harsh, but there is a broader philosophical point to be drawn out of the criticism. By allowing such a broad interpretation of the patent and the definition of direct infringement, there is a greater degree of uncertainty in the law, and this in turn makes it difficult for new products to enter the market. Such a position is understandable and actually aligns closely with the position taken by the European Patent Office itself but does come associated with some disadvantages of its own. Requiring patents to be drafted in such a fine level of detail opens up the possibility that an inventor could be scooped by a bigger company if they have better lawyers who can pull the patent apart in the courts. Clearly then, a balance has to be struck between patents that are drafted in a precise manner and the degree of flexibility on offer in the courts. Overall, I would say that I agree with the judgement in this case, but would raise some questions about how it has been applied. It is right that there is some flexibility, but this has to be limited so that the application of the law in this area does not become so loose as to become meaningless. The questions used by the Supreme Court to identify direct infringement are a good way of achieving this as they get to the core of any invention, i.e. what it does and how it does it. If this closely aligns with the original patent, then surely it is only fair that there is found to be an infringement. However, if we examine this in the context of this particular case, then the application of the rules do leave a little to be desired. To be more specific, we can go back to the third question to be asked when investigating a non-literal direct infringement, i.e. would someone reading the patent conclude that the original inventor intended that strict compliance with the literal meaning was an essential requirement to the invention. Here, an assumption was made by the Supreme Court that the patent was intended to exclude variations on Pemetrexed, but making assumptions is always a dangerous step, and just as it is difficult to step into the mind of a person drafting legislation, so too it is difficult to step into the mind of someone drafting a patent. The case establishes an approach to the law that is perhaps closer to what the man on the street would describe as fair and reasonable, but by doing so in these circumstances the court has opened itself up to future patentees who will push even harder now that the door is ajar. Well thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this episode of the UK Law Weekly podcast. As ever you can check out the website at uklawweekly.com and rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Also, if you want to get in touch with me, then the email address is contact at uklawweekly.com. Also, before we finish off, I just want to say thank you to a couple of people who have left really positive reviews of the podcast on iTunes. These are Spand42 and Fondis3, um, who both left five-star reviews, so that is very much appreciated. Um, thank you very much. Anyway, that's all from me, and I will be back next week with another episode. So in the meantime, bye!